The illegal Israeli occupation of Palestine will be 50 years old next year, in June 2017. The anniversary of the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel took control of large parts of the West Bank and Gaza. But after decades of violence and atrocities against the indigenous population, the occupation has now become a massive money-making undertaking for corporations from Israel and all over the world. The geography of occupation has meant that there are checkpoints all over the West Bank, as this BBC article shows, where Palestinians have to get through to travel to different areas of Palestine and, of course, Israel itself. For years, Israeli checkpoints were manned by the Israeli Defence Forces, or IDF, and Israeli Border Police. But from 2006, there was a new addition to the team. The military and the police are now joined by gun-toting soldiers from a private security company. Today, there are 12 checkpoints in the West Bank and two between Gaza that use private security guards. An article in Mondawise, Meet the Private Security Contractors Manning Israel's Checkpoints, states that, Privatised checkpoints first appeared in 2006, after the Israeli parliament voted for contractors to control or support 35 of the 96 checkpoints in the West Bank. The decision to add private sector operatives was made in the context of a general build-up of checkpoints, following the second intifada, as a means to streamline and manage the increased forces. The company, Modain Ezrachi, is, as Harriet states, the Israeli government's largest provider of security services. They can be seen checking public buses in Jerusalem, manning checkpoints and illegal outposts in the West Bank, and protecting Jewish compounds in East Jerusalem. Guards are accused of terrorizing Palestinians and enabling settler violence, as shown in this Al Jazeera story, Israel gun guards terrorize East Jerusalem. They quote an analyst who says, from a political perspective, Outsourcing is beneficial because even if the abuses are exposed, they are frequently presented to the public as having been perpetrated by someone else. This Haaretz story, State Threatens to Fire Modin Ezrachi for Flouting Labour Law, notes that Modin Ezrachi was found to have systematically violated the rights of security guards. But it has had no effect on the firm attracting more contracts. This is a trend we've witnessed in many other nations, such as Australia, Britain, the United States and Greece, as shown in these Guardian stories. In these cases, governments and private security firms collude to avoid responsibility. There's a long history of Israel-directed humiliation of Palestinians at checkpoints. Israeli human rights group B'Tselem has released countless reports over the years documenting the abuse, as shown here in his Haaretz story. Israeli NGO Who Profits tracks the private sector companies cashing in on the illegal occupation of the West Bank and the resulting misery. They released a report earlier this year which lifted the lid on this incipient trend, private security companies and the Israeli occupation. It reported, in recent decades, many military responsibilities were handed over to private civilian companies, turning the private security industry into one of the fastest growing industries in Israel. Private security companies guard settlements, and construction sites in the occupied Palestinian territories, and some are also in charge of the day-to-day -day operations, security and maintenance of Israeli checkpoints in the West Bank and Gaza. On one level, it's a mystery why Israel feels it needs more muscle at the checkpoints. They've already got a maze of confusion for Palestinians trying to pass through, as this Betselem report, checkpoints, physical obstructions and forbidden roads shows. It notes that Israel's restrictions on Palestinians' freedom of movement in the West Bank are enforced by a system of fixed checkpoints, surprise flying checkpoints, physical obstructions, roads on which Palestinians are forbidden to travel and gates along the separation barrier. The restrictions enable Israel to control Palestinian movement throughout the West Bank as it suits its interests in a sweeping breach of Palestinians' rights. One more level of bureaucracy has not helped. Even if Israel claims more muscle is needed, why not just send more Israeli soldiers? This move is part of a global trend during the same period, from Iraq to Colombia, where private security and military companies increasingly assume state functions when resorting to force. In April this year, at the Kalandia checkpoint, two Palestinians, Maram Hassan Abu Ismail, who was 23, and her brother Ibrahim Saleh Taha, who was 16, were shot dead by Modain Ezrachi, as shown here in his Times of Israel article. It was one of the first high-profile killings done by private security guards at the checkpoints in the West Bank. 
The two, who witnesses said didn't seem to understand instructions in Hebrew, were branded terrorists by the Israeli police for allegedly throwing a knife. Not long afterwards, the defence establishment announced it would drop an investigation into what happened without anybody being charged. The Israeli non-profit Yesh Din wrote in their 2014 report The Lawless Zone that private security forces are equipped with IDF weapons, undergo military training and are empowered to undertake policing actions such as searches and detention and to use force. Until the 1970s, Israel had one of the smallest socio-economic gaps in the West for Jews. The welfare state provided decent support for its Jewish population, but by the mid-1990s, the gap between rich and poor had skyrocketed. Israeli academic David Gutwein, who teaches at the University of Haifa, writes that Israel's ethos of social solidarity has been replaced by an ethos of privatisation. The privatisation revolution was conducted in two tracks, sectorization by the right and commercialization by the left. Both of them, however, advanced economic and social inequality. Today, the results of never-ending outsourcing are clear. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is committed to selling off billions of dollars of state assets, a policy he's proudly led for years. But the Israeli public are paying a high price. Israel has the highest poverty level amongst OECD nations, as shown here in this Ynet article. Many Israelis are leaving because of poor economic conditions, according to this article in the Middle East Eye. It was also the key reason behind Israel's massive 2011 protests against high rents and cost of living, as shown here in The Guardian. But not everybody is suffering. The occupation business is thriving. Take Israeli company Megal Security Systems which wrapped fences around Gaza, assisted construction of the barrier along the Egyptian and Jordan frontiers, and is now building a wall between Kenya and Somalia. The company's head, Saar Korsh, recently told Bloomberg that the border business was down, but then came ISIS and the Syrian conflict. The world is changing, and borders are coming back big time. He's excited about the prospect of Donald Trump's enlarged wall between the US and Mexico. This is just one way that Israel's vast experience of occupation from militarizing borders to surveying unwanted populations is a huge financial benefit to the Israeli economy. It isn't helping most of the population. Poverty is rife after all, but it's possibly enough to insulate Israel from any potential economic headwinds from the growing BDS or boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. Israeli writer and activist Jeff Halper argues in his book War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians and Global Pacification that the occupation is not a burden for Israel, but a resource, because it gives the Jewish state the opportunity to test weapons and surveillance in the field on Palestinians, along with assisting other states in their military and intelligence needs. Ever-growing numbers of European and American officials are visiting Israel to gain knowledge about securitization, militarization, and defense systems. Private companies have been involved from the start in the settlement project in the occupied West Bank. But that involvement and the amounts of money being made has jumped in the past decade. Earlier this year, Human Rights Watch released the report Occupation Inc, which detailed how Israeli and international businesses have helped to build, finance, service and market settlement communities. It added, in many cases, businesses are settlers themselves. This is one of the contradictions of occupation being privatised. While Israeli state transgressions of international law are generally ignored by its biggest benefactor, the United States, the BDS movement has claimed some big wins in terms of pressuring the private sector over affiliations with human rights abuses in Palestine. For example, French infrastructure company Veolia announced it was leaving Israel in April 2015, as shown in this Newsweek article, while mobile phone operator Orange said it would terminate contracts with its Israeli partner just a few months later as shown in this Guardian article. Security company G4S, the biggest private sector employer in the world, announced in 2014 it was leaving the country within three years and terminating its contracts within the Israeli prison system. BDS claimed a victory, but G4S said that while it still planned for a full pullout by June 2017, the decision to not renew the contracts was taken for commercial reasons, as Newsweek reports.
The private sector, however, has made big money from the expanding Israeli prison system, which keeps over 6,000 Palestinian security detainees and prisoners, according to Bet Selim. At the end of 2015, 116 Palestinian children between 12 and 15 years old were held in Israeli military detention, according to this article in the Electronic Intifada. With the Middle East aflame and Israel selling itself as an ocean of stability amidst the region of conflict, there are few compelling reasons why the Jewish state won't continue marketing itself as the ideal way to manage unwanted populations. Private companies are the growing beneficiaries of this policy. 2017 is the 50th anniversary of Israel's occupation of Palestine and colonization is increasing. Without massive international pressure, it's impossible to see how the outsourced occupation won't become a permanent nightmare.